<clears throat> Howdy. <clears throat> oh, let's get some lights. Hang on. Getting some looping. Oh no, that's because I'm watching the stream. Stop that one. Don't need to watch the stream. Hey Tommy. Hi Chris. Hey Space Kitter. So now I can look at my tablet. Right there. Okay. you can see it's up there everything works <clears throat> All right. cool everything is good sweet 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 <clears throat> so let me just write up the definition we had uh, at the uh, end of last lecture a nice topos book <clears throat> Which one's the nice one? two bad boys here <clears throat> okay let's just write this definition yes yes it's the elephant I was a present um, I'm looking at here it is so for anyone who doesn't know the elephant is the nickname of a large Topos theory book. Only two thirds complete. Volume three is still in preparation after 18 years after the previous volumes came out. Can't uh, write and speak unrelated topics. <clears throat> yeah, Space Kidder, I think um, got on special. Like 40% off or something. <clears throat> I have used it. It's not just a paperweight. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so it's not private knowledge, but we found out um, re fairly recently that Peter Johnson had COVID and was hospitalized for five months. Um, so we nearly never got volume three of The Elephant. Let's 
go back to some intro algebraic topology. So this is the definition we ended up at the end of last lecture. <clears throat> what does this what does this do? Some clever clogs in the chat pointed out that the empty graph uh, delta is an isomorphism. But that's not a very interesting um, setup. So we can start applying this to some of our elementary examples. So the smallest one. So this delta square bracket naught is a graph with a single vertex and no edges. It's like triangulation of the point. So I'm not going to draw the everything. All right, so this is it. There's there's one vertex. So a function from one point to the integers is just the integers. And there's a unique function from the empty set of edges to the integers. So yeah, so the zeros here, um, someone did ask, the zeros here are really it's the trivial group. And if we're working over of our general R modules, it's the trivial module with just a zero. Okay, so that's not so interesting. Now let's do something a bit bigger. So recall we have this directed graph um, which looks like a triangle. And call this A, B, C vertices and edges, little A, B, C, directed like this. <clears throat> and so, what does what does the cochain complex look like? So it's functions from this three element set to Z, and this is functions from this element set to Z. All right, so how should we think about it? So this is isomorphic to Z3, this is isomorphic to Z3, but I want to pay attention to what the, the generators are. Because they're both copies of Z3, but the map we're going to write down is, is non trivial. So we need to have a basis for it, a basis for these modules. Okay, so let's call A underline is an element in this group. And what is its effect? It's a function, so you apply it to a vertex. And it's going to be one if V is A and nothing if V is not A. Etc. So I can do the same thing with B and C. And on this side, so A underline. So if the edge is edge A, it's just 1 and 0 otherwise. Do the same with B, C, and B, and C here. So these are our functions. So since we have some some generators, we can write down a matrix. So let's calculate <coughs> the effect of delta on the function a capital A underline. Right, so what is this? So this is a function 
from A, B, C into Z. So it's, we look at the definition, which I just pushed off the screen. There it is. So we apply our function to D naught um, of an edge and then apply a function to D1 of an edge. So it's not quite what I want. I've got delta of A underline applied to an edge is a underline d not edge so a underline d1 edge is equal to well depends on what the edge is so if the edge is a then well, let's quickly draw a thing for reference So if the edge is A, D0, I'll do this different color. D0 of A is C. Um, <clears throat> but then A, capital A underline of the vertex C is zero. And if the edge is B. Okay, now the edge is B. Edge B is incident with vertex capital A. And C should do green. So this here is equal to D1 of B. And we're, we're, we're subtracting that. So D0 of B is capital C. That's zero. This is zero minus zero. It's going to be zero minus one. And E is the edge is C. We also get a minus one. Okay, and this is the sort of thing we had before. Right, so where our edge is coming out of vertex A, we pick up a minus one. So similarly, when you calculate this, um, delta underline B of little c is equal to one, delta underline B of a is equal to minus one, etc. You can figure this out. <clears throat> okay, so we can write down a matrix. Um, let's just call this capital D. Just maybe to disambiguate between the the, the abstract map and the, the matrix that represents it. We go and write this down. Right, so this is what we've calculated here, 0, minus 1, minus 1 is this column, so the first column here. Okay, so that's step 1. We can, we can write down our cochain complex now. Man. Sorry for the loud eating. So we had our motivational question, how far is this from being uh, 
an isomorphism. So let's look at its kernel. It turns out, so kernel of D sits inside Z mod 3. So it's It's a torsion-free abelian group. There is no finite cyclic subgroups. So what we have to do is just write down some generators. And it's generated by constant function okay so this means <coughs> it's a co it's a copy of the integers That bit's not so hard. So we can figure out the image. So, well, the constant function root value of one, in this instance, is the same thing as um, the function which is the sum of these generators. So if you like, it's just one, one, one as a vector. So what's the image? And really the image is so we can get a co-kernel. So I'm assuming, well, I presume people have seen the notion of co-kernel before, but if you haven't, it's just the the codomain of the linear map of the image. All right. And so we're going to really think about co-kernels a lot. Kernels and co-kernels. So we first need the image. So it's generated by um, where the columns of D but I'm going to pick a particular linear combination of, G, of those columns, which makes it a bit easier. So the image of D, the range of D. So it sits inside Z3 again. So it's a torsion-free abelian group. We just need to write down some generators. So, so now we have to think about what is the uh, the quotient of Z three by the subgroup generated by these two uh, these two vectors. Okay, so if we're working over vector spaces, um, <coughs> well, characteristic zero vector spaces like R or Q, this is pretty easy, uh, relatively speaking, but because we're over the integers, we have to make sure that we don't get um, in the quotient group a finite cyclic group. All right, so if one of these entries um, in here was a, was a, a two, say, you could get weird things happening. Yeah. A bunch of co-prime numbers in these, vec these vectors. But in fact, it turns out to be 
isomorphic to Z because we can find uh, a third vector in Z in Z3 that together with the two that generate this subgroup gives us all of Z3. And say zero zero one. All right. Any questions? Comments, thoughts? Ah, oh, good question. So one way to do it is to find the null space of this matrix. <clears throat> so you go into reduce row echelon form um, but making sure only doing row operations that uh, multiply by scalars is integers. I can't divide by anything. The other way to uh, do it is a slightly more inspirational way. We just stare at the columns and say what linear combination of those columns gives zero. And the sum of those three columns gives zero by inspection. But that's sort of slightly higher order sort of thinking. So it's yeah perfectly okay to just do row operations, find the null space. So Tess, you're asking why these two vectors? Yeah, because it's not it's not unique. Um, I could find any two vectors that were independent that were in the row, uh, sorry, in the column space of um, D. So I picked these particular um, vectors because there was no minus signs. So that's a good question. So on my, my B plus C, say so my B plus C here. That's just the negative of the first column of D. And then uh, A plus B is minus the sum of the first two columns. This is like column one. And then column three is minus, oh no, that's equal to column three, blue. And then you can check that column two is a linear combination of columns one and three. Um, so Tyson, we could use rank nullity if we're over a field. I'd be slightly careful because I'm working over Z. Because, um, well, yeah, rank, I mean, you could, the kernel could be something that when you quotient by the kernel, you get a finite cyclic sum and.
Sorry, one moment. Uh, make sure I'm getting all the messages. Discord. Yeah, so at this point, you have to be a little bit careful. And with here, it works out rather nice. In particular, talking about arbitrary abelian groups, the rank and the dimension are two different things. Or like, when you say dimension, you say what's like the smallest number of generators. So there will be an example somewhere along the line where these things really don't coincide. All right, so <clears throat> does that answer your question, Tess? And Tyson? And Space Kitter? Cool. So here's claim, which shouldn't surprise people who may have seen things like this before. Yeah, maybe I should say a little bit about this co-kernel thing. But since my Z3 here is generated by these two vectors plus a third one, um, it's really just killing the... the <clears throat> think of Z as Z, direct sum Z, direct sum z and we're killing the direct sum of the first two and my remaining vector here is the generator of the last uh, sum end. Sort of it's like an orthogonal decomposition um, but not quite. Okay so my claim, so we saw that the kernel was z and now the co-kernel is also Z. Claim is that this is the cycle in the triangle. And this is kind of the point about cohomology, is we've separated out um, the fact that this graph is connected, which I claim is this first, first fact here, this constant function. You should really think of it as being a locally constant function. Just that because the graph is connected, it's actually constant. So we've separated the fact that this directed graph is connected from the fact it has a cycle. So the Euler characteristic is zero. Which tells us something. Um, it's related to the homotopy group, space kisha, but not in a way that's obvious. In particular, if you have two cycles, then for those that know about these things, the homotopy group is a free group on two generators, um, but that's not what we get here. In particular, it's going to be a, a quotient group of a bunch of copies of Z, which is definitely not non-abelian let alone free. <clears throat> so it's actually a very nice relation, but we can chat about that outside class. Um, da, da, da. Okay, so here's a big, here's a big note. Oh, 
we don't even need Z. Let's so let's keep it Z, it's fine. So if our graph is finite, we can generate these modules uh, by indicator function. So this is what I wrote down before. Um, you know, because they're finitely generated abelian groups, and we can just write down, you know, some basis vectors. So not, and so this is basic. So when the graph is finite. Then these groups of functions here are actually the same as direct sums, and so we can write down a basis in a nice way. And it's just <coughs> looking for the behavior that you get on the the groups of functions, which is different from the behavior from the free group, free abelian group generated by these sets of edges and vertices. But if we have an infinite graph, we can't do it. Um, so if we take this directed graph which is infinite in both directions. Then Z to the E, it doesn't have a countable basis. Well, generating set. And same for z, uh, z to the power of v. So we have to be a little bit careful in that case and really just think of them as functions. All right, so let's do another couple of simple examples. This is example three. Remember, this is the directed graph with two vertices and one edge. Then this looks like z squared, z zero. And we have in here two functions. So I called these edges, uh, sorry, these vertices zero and one, and the edge zero one. So this has, looks like generators one underline, zero underline, and one underline. And then we can ask what's delta of zero applied to the single generator of, of this copy of Z. equal to minus one is equal to one because going back to our sort of old ad hoc uh, description our edge is pointing out of the vertex zero so that we pick up a minus one and it's pointing into the vertex one so we pick up a one. So then we might represent delta here by this one by two matrix, minus one, one. 
So again, the kernel is the constant functions on the vertex set. So it's generated by the vector 1, 1. And the co-kernel is zero because it's, this map is on two. And if we believe this idea that the co-kernel somehow measures something about cycles, then this shouldn't be surprising because we have no cycles in this little directed graph here. Ooh, go away. Um, all right, that's maybe enough concrete manipulations. So we're going to state a lemma, then we can sort of stop and think about what that means. So a lot of um, thinking about how we get these cochain complexes from our graphs and later from more complicated things. Part of it boils down to knowing how this operation of taking a set and returning the set of functions behaves. So if you're given two sets, right, in principle there's two ways ignoring everything else, how do you get uh, an R module. So one way, take the disjoint union and then look at functions, so the, the ring R. The other way is to form the functions on those two sets. And this is a pair of R modules and so we just really 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 want to take their direct sum. And there's a map, a linear map, from the first to the second. Which restricts to each set and then gives us the, the tuple of the two resulting functions. This is an isomorphism. <clears throat> so if we partition up um, a set, you know, say we're given a set, we partition it, so it's a disjoint union of the two things in the partition, doesn't matter that, uh, that's not going to give us more information. Um, up to isomorphism, but it might be useful for writing down it's like matrices or actual computations. We're not changing the real content. Um, Alright, so second thing, we always care about what happens to functions. Oh no, not functions. Starting with a single function. Could start with a pair of functions and build up, but I can also do it this way. So I've partitioned the domain, so it's additional union, same with the codomain, and it's compatible with what this function does. So it maps everything S1 to S2, everything in T1 to T2, and then uh, we can think about part A. You get the direct sum of the two restricted functions. Um, oh, 
that's a one. Okay. Uh, lemma A, lemma part A, yes, Peter. So this works for any finite number of sets. So yeah, if you partition any given set into a finite number of sub disjoint subsets, then you can play this trick. K restricted to T1. Yes, thank you, Luke. Yep. Okay, so I'm secretly hiding some isomorphisms in here. So if you strictly look at the domain of these things, Tyson, yes. Oh, heat at the moment. I was getting excited. Seeing some category theory. Also, I was improvising with some notation. <clears throat> Thanks, Tyson. All right, so you can think of this as being a block decomposition. All right, so K, uh, the restriction of K to S1 and to T1 might not be representable by a finite matrix, but we can at least block it up like this. And that can help. Okay, so as a corollary, and we'll have a slight pause. Even a pair of directed graphs, we get, uh, yeah, sorry, Tess, that's right. So K star is the map where you precompose by K. Precompose with, yep. So an element of the module is a function, so you, um, and so then you can pre-compose with that function. Pre-compose pre that function with K. Yeah, so K is a function of sets. But K star is a function between modules. And it's not the dual of anything. It's a good, good pickup. All right. So if we have directed graphs, the map delta associated to the disjoint union is the same as the direct sum of the two separate delta maps for each of the graphs. That's the first fact. And the kernels do the same thing. Um, nope, these are arbitrary. So it's only a... The gammas can be infinite but the fact there's only two of them right if i had an infinite string of gammas like gamma one gamma two gamma n for all natural numbers and took the disjoint union of them all i couldn't save this um uh tyson is that your mm, sorry i guess that's an implicit 
warning not to write too small that the resolution is not great. Okay, so in one sense this means we can reduce the thinking about uh, these kernels of deltas just to the connected components at least uh, when we've only got finitely many connected components. We've had infinitely many connected components then uh, something happens which is fine but we'll leave that for when we're doing the general theory. All right, so I had the claim that co-kernel is something about cycles and this corollary should be giving us um, hope that the kernel is something about the number of connected components. Excuse me. Okay. Any other comments? So one thing to think about is we have an intuitive idea about uh, the corollary or the lemma um, twice and any lemma that I don't prove feel free to um, have a crack at proving it yourself because it's not going to be something that's mysterious it's just maybe checking some things um, Chris uh, yes this is roughly right so when we get to cohomology so I did write here that the co-kernel just splits up but that does as well I just want to sort of give the motivation for maybe thinking that the kernel of this map delta somehow measures components of the graph connected components of the graph so one thing you could do is think about what is the definition of a connected directed graph so this is more of a question to think about I'm not giving a definition, even a finite connected graph, say. We would hope, or maybe suspect, and we, we know that if the graph is disconnected with some partition into two subgraphs then the kernel splits as a direct sum and let's say we do that down to the point where we can't split the graph into a disjoint unit of subgraphs and then what is the kernel just z it's not clear not a priori ok 
Okay, so just so you know, we're going to have a five minute break in about five minutes. Just see if you need to get up and stretch, grab something to drink. All right. So I was talking about subgraphs. Uh, so Tommy, do you see how to prove it? Like literally off the top of your head. Like given what we've done so far, it's provable. Like we haven't got many definitions. We've got the definition of a simple directed graph. We've got the definition of the map delta. And I claim it's provable now, at least in the finite case, where I mean, you can write down matrices and things. Uh, Tommy, this isn't about spaces. So you're not thinking of the graph as a space, like the picture. It's literally a point, uh, points, vertices, and then just edges is a combinatorial thing. Yeah, and so homotopy is useless here because you can't homotopy a combinatorial object. This is just sets of things. So for anyone who's um, not seen this stuff before, uh, we're going to get this base kitter. Um, once we even get to spaces, we've got a couple of weeks before we get there. We've got to build our weapons first, um, and then we can start attacking spaces. <clears throat> oh, you can get a topology. We'll get there. Um, it's probably some young Padawan joke or grasshopper or something that I should say right now. Okay. All right, maybe one more definition and then we'll have a quick break. So one thing I've sort of been sloppy about saying simple directed graph. And that's because the simple part, right, that says no self loops, no uh, edges from a vertex to itself. And the requirement there's at most one edge between any two vertices. This is unnecessarily restrictive. We're not modeling a specific, you know, real world network thing like friendship networks or um, <clears throat> social media follows and things like this. So we're going to drop simple for good. So it sets sets of edges and vertices and a pair of functions d0, d1 that assign to an edge its um, you know, it's incoming and outgoing vertex respectively. So I draw this little cartoon again. And I'm changing notation too, so I'm not doing uh, like V sub gamma and E sub gamma because we're going to go higher dimensional at some point. 
and I don't have good letters for all those things. So zero, zero dimensional, and one is one dimensional. So there should be vertices and edges respectively. So now we're allowed to say things like this. We have one edge, one vertex, and then D zero of E is X, which is also D one of E. So we're dropping the fact um, that we require some injectivity and also avoiding the diagonal of the vertices. And we can do things like this. All right. Cool. So we will have a small pause, have a stretch. I can stick around and answer questions if you want to. Uh, if you want to ask any. We'll be back in five minutes.
All right. Good questions. <coughs> it's pointed out over on Discord that if we have such a break, um, typing the questions in Discord um, means that people can come back later more than me answering verbally or on Twitch. Sorry, Tommy got a question. Um, yeah, just verbally, Tommy, this is true, but not at this point. So, it depends if you think of a cell complex as an actual space. I suppose people do so yeah so when we get to spaces we'll come back and we'll see how we can turn graphs into spaces whether your eraser is being so laggy I think it's by how much I've got on the screen oh how did people find this little time indicator these are the four time zones I think that everyone or almost everyone is in. I assume people know how to figure out which one they're in. Okay. So we've been talking about constructions not just on sets but on functions we haven't talked about functions of graphs yet so I've we've now dropped the simple part and leave that challenge temporarily on the screen for a little bit longer Okay, so change to writing color. All right, so a map directed graphs. So for a pair of maps, one for uh, the vertices, one for the edges, I'm going to have to satisfy a condition. So D0 So I compose the F and the D0 either way round, it's the same the same with a D1. So it respects, it sends an edge to an edge and the corresponding vertices to the corresponding vertices. So the easiest one to think about is the inclusion of a subgraph. So I'm going to draw this and leave you to imagine what the actual functions would be. I might label these. Basically, it's A to A, etc. And the labels are immaterial, really. 
Um, <clears throat> so we could also just do the inclusion of something so as trivial as an edge, a single edge or a single vertex. Sticking with my little triangle example here. And now I have three functions. And same here, just because I have three uh, edges. Actually, let me throw in a, f a few more edges. Six of those. It doesn't have to be injective. Go to um, wrap this one around, for instance. And let's send x to z and x to x and y to y. All right, um, here's another couple of examples. Uh, it's a cyclic graph. All right, so I'm drawing arrows differently. All right, so the edges, the arrows are sort of in the middle of the uh, of the edge. And the functions or the mappings between graphs, let me annotate this. So this is a map. And the edges look like this. Just to disambiguate. So what I could do is map all the vertices to a single vertex and all the edges to a single edge. And it doesn't have to be all uh, the edges going the same way in this particular example. For instance, Okay, now the question you should be asking yourself every time you have a construction and you get new data that looks like it could feed into that, constru into that construction, then you should say, what does that do to the construction? So what have we known so far? Uh, <clears throat> we have a chain co-chain complex associated to a directed graph. All right, so let's say we have a map F from gamma to G. And we have chain complexes, co-chain complexes. I mean, I was talking about Z before. Well, we're allowed to use an arbitrary R. I'll switch to using R and just reflect that. Just because it's slightly visually cleaner. OK, 
Okay, and so I'm changing the notation for the graph as well. So this in the old notation, I was using just Z and I had V gamma. All right, so we're just upgrading our notation slightly for generality. Okay, so we have this chain complex, cochain complex. And we know right, we have F nor and F1 is the data of F and they induce maps linear maps in this direction so let me draw this square and pop a little question mark in it because maybe we'd like to say that this square commutes or that delta G is the same as so that's gamma So this is the question. Do we have an equality here? And we do. It's not, it's maybe a one or two line calculation. I encourage you to do it. In fact, I think it might be on the assignment. So you will be doing it. Um, Tommy, um, if the graphs are isomorphic, then F0 and F1 are bijections, and so they induce isomorphisms of these R modules. So that simplifies things, maybe. Um, but it's true in general. So it always commutes. So these are linear maps. Um, yeah, gamma nor and G nor. Sorry, gamma and G can be very different graphs. And it still commutes, but. Uh, it tells us something a little bit more than this. This is assignment one. It's on assignment one. So this implies, so let's say G, little g, is in the kernel of delta G. then uh, delta gamma f naught star of g with the truck is the same as f1 star delta g of little g but that's zero and f1 star is linear so that's zero so then F naught star G is in the kernel of delta gamma.
So what this means is we get a map from the kernel of delta G to the kernel of delta gamma. Um, that's compatible with everything we've seen so far the inclusions and the F naught star. Okay. So this is cool. Then also, now let's try something in the co kernel. What happens then? Uh, let's say the equivalence class, Peter. Don't think we've got enough for the snake lemma which we're not going to see for a little bit. I want people to believe that the snake lemma is sensible when they see it. By seeing all the little calculations first. So let's take something in the co-kernel of delta G. Right, so this G is in Oh, let's write it this way. No, we'll do it this way. All right, it's a map from G1 to R. And I'm taking its equivalence class, sort of mod the coset sort of, of image of delta G. So now we're going to try Again, oh, that's too many tries. Let's look at what F1 star of G is inside the co kernel of delta gamma. Well, that's something you can do. All right, let's just. I've, I've picked something in the co-kernel of delta G, chosen a representative little g as a function from G1 to R, pushed it across by F1 star, and then look what that looks like in the co-kernel. Uh, F star is restricted to the kernel of delta G. D banner. Yeah, because this is what we were doing. We are saying if G is in the kernel of delta G, then I apply F0 to it then it's still inside the kernel of delta gamma. So when I just apply F0 star to things in the kernel of delta G, it lands inside the submodule, which is the kernel. Okay, so this little diagram here is our setup. Going back to the co-kernel case. Right, so I start with something inside the co-kernel. That's this element here. I pick little g as a function here as a representing element because I know this this map is onto. I apply F1 star and 
and then I push it down into the co-kernel. So look at its equivalence class down here. Okay, that's something I can do. What if I chose a different representative? I made a different choice of, th of something that's a function from G1 to R. So this is the same thing as saying that uh, I wanted, oh that's okay, G1 minus G2 is in the image of delta G. And so let's call it delta G of K, say. Now let's consider f1 star g1 minus f1 star g2 that's the same thing as f1 star delta g of k because f1 star is linear but that's the same thing as delta gamma f0 star of k which is in the image of delta gamma and so since the difference here is inside the image of delta these two things represent the same image in the co uh, the same element of the co-kernel Okay, so then we get a well-defined function here at the level of co-kernels. You have to check that it's actually R linear but it is. Um, once we know there's a well-defined function, you can yeah, pick representatives up at uh, this level and see what it does. All right, so We can define our first cohomology of the course. So we get a pair of R modules. But not just modules associated to each graph, F there exists a linear 
maps. In the reverse direction, which we'll just generically call F star. Okay. So we've come a long way from the Euler characteristic. Any questions, comments, and so on. So one thing, ah, uh, so Tess, yes, secretly this is true, we haven't proved this. I think you might look at this in the tutorial on Friday, because at least for finite graphs, there are some nice um, concrete proofs can draw uh, you can draw down you can sort of draw some cartoons figure out some matrices and so on um, so Chris yes this is true maps between graphs induce maps in cohomology in the reverse direction because elements of these cohomology modules either are functions or are represented by a function and the map on uh, of graphs you can pre-compose and you get a, a function on the the domain graph and so Billy um, if they didn't know what it was uh, ideally they could be taking the course um, Yeah, I mean it's essentially something like I want to measure how complicated my graph is but only at sort of a topological level so cycles connected components and um, Luke's point is that we definitely be learning about more complicated things right we only have H0 H1 when we get to higher dimensional combinatorial things, we will definitely have more cohomology modules. We'll be looking at how to calculate them in various ways, apart from just like bare hands, write down matrices stuff. But the idea that you can actually draw a picture, identify some functions, write down some matrices, this is all doable um, so Tyson it's induced by the same um, the same F's right, so gamma and G both have like a zero dimensional and a one dimensional one dimensional bit and so F has a zero dimensional bit and a one dimensional bit and so for H0 everything's induced by F0 and for F1 is induced by, is sorry, the map on the H1s is induced by F1. Yeah, so your point Tyson about connected graphs, we'll come back to that. Um, secretly, yes. I'm not sure we can quite do that yet. So Chris, yeah, homology in some respects and people do start off with it in other courses and a lot of books. 
but there are things you can't do with homology. And when you look at what's actually done in algebraic topology, most of it is actually cohomology. Um, yeah, so Space Kitter, Luke has pointed out that the cohomology modules are the, in this instance, it's the kernel and the co kernel associated with the cochain complex. So the cochain complex is a thing that's a bit too detailed, right? it contains too much information and it's not invariant under various things. So it doesn't measure um, cycles, for instance. There's too much stuff there. Yeah, Chris, it's a richer invariant, and we're going to get to that. Um, so as far as spoilers go, uh, we can take the direct sum of these two things. Well, and when we get more, we take the direct sum of all of the available ones and we get an algebra, not just a module. Yeah, Peter, I'm not so sure about that comment, but... Um, They're different things. They're complementary. Anyway, it's a, it's a good discussion. Mm, space Kidder, I don't think so. It's not quite that um, direct. There's a thing called Poincaré duality, which only holds for some spaces, which kind of links these things. So Razor, um, so one place where I know homology is really used is, is in persistent homology, which is pretty new and it gets used as a kind of statistical tool applied to data. But if you're talking um, any type of geometry, a differential geometry, algebraic geometry, um, sort of algebraic topology itself, even like number theory, cohomology is is more common in my experience. So some of the applications right down the end of the course arose out of number theory originally going back to like Hilbert so there's stuff that Hilbert did in like <clears throat> commutative algebra number theory which sort of 30 years later realized were actually statements about cohomology um, Tommy yes I think that's so because you get this extra algebra structure. So you can have isomorphic, you can have even isomorphic cohomology modules, but as an algebra, they're not the same. No space kitter. Um, They're more like homotop they Yeah, Luke. And I learned this stuff, it was all Duram cohomology. Yeah, cool. This is a great discussion. I think Space Kitter's question is gotta take a bit too much to unpack right now. So we'll do the next right thing. So let's see if we can bring it back to where we started. All right, we started with Euler characteristic. Um, 
So recall for a directed graph, Euler characteristic, a finite directed graph, is the number of, well, it's the size of gamma zero in our new notation minus the size of gamma one. And so, how does this relate to what we've done? All right, so somehow, you know, this can do things like I can tell apart a directed graph that's just a single edge with two distinct vertices and a directed graph that's a single edge from one vertex to itself. This makes sense. It's one and zero respectively. But we can now see this as just a shadow of what's happening at the level of cohomology. Alright, so the number of edges and the number of vertices, you know, they are specific to the graph, but if we're squinting and not counting the vertices or the edges, and as someone pointed out earlier, we want to kind of think of them maybe like a space, the exact numbers of edges and vertices are not important for the purposes of counting cycles, for instance. And so the cohomology modules are somehow more intrinsic Q so Q here is the rational numbers it could be the real numbers um, yeah test good question I just want it to be a vector space over a field of characteristic zero. So if we used a ring, Tommy, then uh, slightly weird stuff can happen. Yeah, DMN, that's right. So, alternatively, one could use Z and the rank of the module. But that's the same thing as going, well, I'll pretend everything's over Q, all the finite subgroups die, and I'm just looking at the dimension of the vector space. Okay, so we can prove this. It's not long. Um, so let's look at the right hand side. So what is this? Dimension of the kernel of delta gamma because kernel of delta gamma is H0. Uh, whoops. Just substituting the definitions of what H0 and H1 are. But now we can use things like um, things we know about rank of a linear operator and dimension of subspaces and so on so because this is a this here is a vector space the um, the co-kernel 
I shouldn't say that because the functions from gamma 1 to q are a vector space we can think about the dimension of the co-kernel as the um, the difference of dimensions of the ambient vector space minus the dimension of the image so in symbols Yeah, so Peter, that's another way of putting what I was trying to say without saying the word tensor, but if you know what that means, that's exactly right. All right, so the dimension of the co-kernel is the difference of the dimensions here. So we take the functions from gamma 1 to q and quotient out the subspace which is the image of delta gamma and the quotient vector space has dimension this difference here and this is really why we want a vector space so this bit makes sense um, and now we're going to use something like the rank nullity theorem Just rearranging. All right. <clears throat> I should say gamma finite. <sighs> Index theory razor. Well, if these things were infinite dimensional and delta gamma was Fred Holm, then these dimensions would be well defined and you would have an index here. But I'm not quite sure how the index theory proper would be applicable because we've really only got the algebraic side. It's a good question. I don't know. But the dimension of the functions from gamma 1 to q, if gamma 1 is finite, is precisely the size of gamma. Uh, test that's that's like nuking a mosquito um, KK theory is a long way from here um, but the rank nullity theorem first year linear algebra tells that this one here is oh, I have too many equals dimension of Q to the gamma naught but we just agreed that was the same as the size of the set gamma naught which is precisely the Euler characteristic of gamma in the traditional sense Okay. So we haven't lost information. We can still recover the Euler characteristic and we'll always be able to do that from this formalism and if we go back up into higher dimensions, so for surfaces, 
it's going to work. Um, high dimensional version is going to work too. But we have a better invariant now. It's not just a number. We've got a, a module and it behaves in a way that's compatible with functions of graphs, maps of graphs. And I'm going to denote cohomology generically with like a H bullet. End of proof. So here's the magic word, functorial. Just write it clearly for the first time it appears. Because it interacts with maps of graphs. So this is the thing basically that springs out of sort of the ideas of Emmy Noether. When you go back to pre-1920s mathematics People talked about subgroups or ideals or submodules, and they talked about quotient groups, quotient modules, but sort of arbitrary algebraic map. And they talked about matrices, right? but like the idea of an arbitrary algebraic map of things um, really sort of sprung to life, I believe with the um, sort of the idea of having topology which Noether got from people like Alexandrov at algebra and saying we're seeing similar behavior on both sides we're seeing maps of geometric or topological objects and you can get algebraic maps and these things aren't working in isolation And this is why we want these modules rather than just things like their dimensions here. All right, so these dimensions are the things that people work with in the, um, the after the work of Riemann, after Poincaré, and Poincaré started introducing the ideas of um, homology and so on. And they also counted things like um, the size of cyclic subgroups. Yes, let's say we're working with Z rather than Q here. All right, so say we take Z and we look at the torsion subgroup. And then we can look at that decomposition into a direct sum of cyclic subgroups. And they would look at the sizes of those. They wouldn't think of them necessarily as groups. There'd be the list of numbers, which is the sizes. And so space kitter. Um, category theory was introduced to talk about natural transformations from one cohomology to a different cohomology. So it's the next level again. Um, so Chris, homological algebra came along a little bit after, I would say. Um, so they had check cohomology and something called simplicial cohomology. I'm not sure singular homology was around yet on those. It was kind of around. 
and people were throwing around homology and cohomology. Um, there was Durham cohomology. There was more analytic things um, like arising from complex analysis. And for some, some constructions of cohomology, there was extra data which was somehow irrelevant and you wanted to take account to all possible choices of that data. And so for each choice of data, you got some cohomology modules and you had to sort of compare these with each other. But it was all attached to the same space. And, you know, the, the level of complexity of all the various bits of data and maps between things, how do you organize all this? And so Eilenberg and McLean, one coming from topology, one coming more from algebra and logic, put their heads together and came up with categories. And here ends the lesson. Not literally, but it's sort of a potted caricature, if you like. Okay, so we need some actual definitions of categories and so forth. So I'll give the bare definition of cate category. And you can go out and hunt, for example, say on Wikipedia or anywhere. There's lots of them. So let me just write this down. So in particular, we won't get to define functors. Uh, Kita, I don't think the NLAB is quite the place to send unwarned people. And I say that as an NLAB vet. Okay, so a category. So we've seen a bunch of them. I just want to formalize this. So the category C, it has data called objects. So I am completely aware of the foundational sensitivities around the size, proper classes and sets and so on. But let's not go into that right now. You just have some collection of objects, some collection of morphisms, for each ordered pair of objects. And we have composition maps. So it's a big C and a little C. And identity maps. So identity more so an identity morphism. Specified identity morphism. In each uh, going from an object to itself. So identities act as they should. Right? It's the identity map. You compose it with something else, it does nothing. So for instance, and same on the other side.
and associativity. So if you have three morphisms, say from A to B, B to C, C to D, and you wish to compose these, the order doesn't matter. It's like composition of functions. And I think that's everything. All right, so I gave the game away. A category of sets, commonly denoted bold or underlined set. Is the prototypical example. One more, uh, let's say, fix a ring R in the category of R modules. So the objects equals R modules and the morphisms are linear functions. Ah, uh, Kita, that's, that's true, but let's not, let's not run away with ourselves. We need to find functors first. <clears throat> okay, so yeah, your mission, should you choose to accept it, Look up examples of categories on the internet and see how many you recognize. Um, one student once said to me when he was a PhD student, first year maths, they should give you the definition of category and then say this subject is about the category of vector spaces and then you would do that subject. And this subject is about the category of groups and then do that subject. So oversimplification, but you'll realize that lots and lots of things you've studied assemble themselves into categories. So Peter is asking a technical question that's foundationally sensitive. Um, so a category that's not locally small uh, the category of all functors from set to itself, for instance. All or, yeah, that's, that's an example. Yeah, so I think, oh my goodness, that is a serious sound system. Um, <clears throat> I'd hate to be in that car right now. Yeah, so everything we're going to be doing in this class, I think is going to be locally small, if you know what that means. It's just saying that for every pair of objects, the collection of morphisms between those objects is a set. So there are examples where this might be a proper class because you're working with things that are somehow too big, like are themselves proper classes. But we won't be touching on such foundational um, issues. All right, given that we're just slightly over time, thanks everyone. Uh, the first assignment is out. I've put it as due roughly the middle of the day in next Wednesday. 
but I'm open to argumentation to move it to late at night um, just in case people want to work late it, it only covers stuff that we're that we're going to be doing this week so what you've got now is not quite enough to do the assignment but the next couple of days we're going to cover that and so then you have the weekend and a few more days and um, I'm going to pop out a quiz um, it should be up now but life and so on so as soon as I can I'm going to put up an online quiz in canvas and um, once I pop it up let's see I mean I might make it let do late tomorrow night once you start it you have a limited time to do the quiz you can start at any time once it comes out up until the due date all right thanks for all your uh, votes of confidence there in the chat don't forget to like hit like and subscribe uh cool catch you later happy to chat in discord further about all the stuff okay bye